Hello and happy Ada Lovelace Day, everyone. You may or may not know what that means or why that matters, but it is an important day for us to celebrate and honor the achievements of women in STEM and STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. So this is a day where these ladies on these panels, they are going to shine. They're going to share their stories and hopefully give us some insights on how we can participate and uplifting them specifically, as well as other women um, who are curious about STEM. Um, so thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Andra. I myself, I, again, am an entrepreneur and a uh, robot lover. I spent my uh, personal journey working through the ranks of consumer electronics and eventually finding my way into a uh, robotics moonshot uh, to make everyday robots uh, at X and I'm, I'm excited to be here but um, you know if you are all in person just speaking directly to you the panelists if we were in person I would hug each and every one of you and I wish that we had met sooner than today because you are just goals all of you across the board from research to industry the diversity of experience on this panel is uh, fantastic. And I, I just want to start things off by allowing you to introduce yourselves. And before I hand it off to you, I just want to say, don't hold back. Like, I want to hear all of the long laundry list of accomplishments that you have, who you are, whatever your values are, whatever you want to highlight and share, do it. Don't feel like this has to be a typical corporate intro. Let us know who you are, your family, your interests. Uh, I want to hear about how awesome you are. So I'll, I'll kick it off uh, with Ayana, who's at the top of our, our list today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, attempt. Yay, I think it will work. So uh, I'm Ayanna Howard. I've been doing robotics um, now probably my entire life. Uh, my first robot was built uh, when I was in high school, which happened to be uh, in the 90s. So that tells you how old I am. Um, and, I've, and I haven't left robotics since then. And, and so one of the things I'm gonna talk about, uh, I very rarely talk about um, the research that I do, but I am, and uh, I know we only have like five to 10 minutes. So I just picked a couple of the stories that um, I enjoy. Um, and so one of the things that I work on is collaborative robotics. And so collaboration is about human robot interaction uh, at the end of the day. Um, and my training was as an engineer. So I grew up as an engineer major. Uh, even when I went to grad school, I was electrical engineering with a minor in computer science. And so this whole aspect of people uh, was kind of strange to me. Um, I understood that we needed people for data, but having robots interact with people was a little bit different. And so my first career when I was at NASA, it was collaborative robotics, but science-driven robotics is you, you use a scientist to get data and that information was then transplanted to the rovers so that they could mimic, but you didn't have this in-depth collaboration. And now um, since I last 15 years, it has been this in-depth collaboration. And so a couple of things that I work on um, that I enjoy, I design, deploy, build, robots and algorithms to enable robots to interact with children with special needs. Uh, children uh, either on um, autism, so ASD, as well as uh, children with motor uh, impairments, primarily children with cerebral palsy. Um, and that's really um, interesting because it requires me to understand the different aspects of human-human interaction. How do you grab data from experts when they're, they're not coders, they're not developers, but they are experts in their field. They know how to do, but how you translate that. Um, and so that's been amazing and it's been interesting uh, because you also have to interact with non-engineers and non-computer scientists. And so how do you engage them from the beginning in the science as experts and how do you get them interested and passionate about what you're doing? Um, and, and that's been a journey, but it's been amazing. And I've met a number of clinicians that have uh, interacted with us and we deploy in, in hospitals and clinics and uh, has resulted in a startup and things like that. But one of the things working with children with special needs, which is what we call a vulnerable population, um, early on, I realized that a lot of the systems we deploy were not only not accessible, but they were not inclusive, right? So we were using off the shelf software and it didn't work. I was working with kids, first of all, and then I was working with kids with special needs. So nothing really worked. 
Um, and so I started looking at um, a lot of the things and a lot of the tools that we needed to enable our robots to work in this field that didn't. And so had done some early work in facial recognition bias, um, looking at age bias primarily because, you know, kids are readily available in your data sets. Um, and if you look at a lot of the software and the APIs that are out there, they say it works for everyone, but we, we know that it doesn't. Um, and, you know, when you have robots deployed in the field and it doesn't work, it's a problem. And when it doesn't work and can cause harm, it's a real problem. Uh, so we really pivoted uh, quite a lot to trying to design methods to not only recognize and identify and quantify the biases, but also develop solutions so that it works. Because it's, it's one thing to say, oh, this is really bad, but I mean, my robots still have to work. They're going into the hospital tomorrow. So what can we do in order to ensure that it works in the field? Um, so we've looked at facial recognition bias. We've also looked at gender and racial bias with respect to everything from language, how our robots talk to kids, what kind of words they use, how they interpret what's being said. Uh, there's, there's actually biases in language, uh, which we sort of know this in terms of like hate speech, but there's even bias when I talk to a child and how I communicate and based on their culture. If, I, if my robot says something to a, a young uh, black boy in Atlanta, and receives it in a different way, the language is actually unique and interesting and diverse, which off the shelf systems don't understand. Um, and so again, recognizing these biases and, and coming up with solutions, both with respect to gender, but also racial biases um, in that aspect. Uh, and so I get to play with toys as well, which is awesome uh, as a roboticist. And so lastly, uh, we also, my group works on this aspect of overtrust because one of the things we found is that when people interact with these robots, uh, users, parents, clinicians, therapists, even though there's mistakes, even though there's biases, people like general society, people still believe in these systems. Like, yeah, it may be a little bit wrong, but it's correct and it's right. And I'm gonna follow the decision, which is, is problematic. Um, especially since these decisions are influencing our own decisions. And so the historical biases are also influencing our own biases and is amplifying this. Um, and so we're also developing solutions to try to mitigate that. Um, and so with that, uh, that's me in a nutshell. I just picked a couple of the projects that are current that we're working on that I'm excited about, uh, but we do a lot of stuff in my group. And if you ask me next week, it'll probably be a whole nother different set of things uh, because I, I really enjoy uh, just working and developing and designing and working with people. And with that, I am done. Thank you so much, Dr. Ayana. I, I don't want to forget to include everyone's title. I don't think, I think I might be the only one on the panel without a PhD. So thank you, Dr. Ayana, for And we for can that. change that. You know that. <laughs> Yes, it was definitely an honor to uh, be able to watch your work uh, from Georgia Tech. I'll just say shout out to any Yellow Jackets, any other Yellow Jackets on the call. And I'll quickly hand it over to Dr. Carlotta Berry to, to give us her introduction as well. Thank you so much. And I cannot believe I have to follow the Dr. Ayana Howard. Um, I would like to actually congratulate her. She didn't mention it, but um, two of the slides had her book on it which I downloaded from Audible last week, but I haven't finished it yet. But I went back into Amazon today to share the um, book with some of my colleagues and it is now the number one bestseller on Amazon. I don't know if she knew that. So I wanted to congratulate her on that. And then I'm gonna get my slides. And I'm actually, I wanna apologize in advance as well. I've had the summer of bronchitis in case the coughing fit starts up. That's just what it is. Um, so, I am a professor of, let me know if you guys can see the slides. Let me confirm that first. Yes, okay. So I am a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Rose-Hulman Institute of Technology, which is in Terre Haute, Indiana. A lot of people have never heard of it because it's a very small town. It's about an hour west of Indianapolis and it is a teaching school. So being that it's a teaching school, we do not have PhD students, the highest degree, um, that our students can earn is a master's. Um, the majority of our students get a course-based master's. So a lot of what I'm going to share with you is how we do robotics for undergraduates. So if I do research or professional development, I do it primarily with undergraduate students, which also presents some unique challenges. 
because they may not always have the prerequisite skills that they need to have in order to be successful, but you can make it happen and you make it work. So that's what I'm gonna share with you today. Oh my God, Yana, I was late to the robotics game. Um, I was an engineer by happenstance. I have a math degree from Spelman College and an electrical engineering degree from Georgia Tech, so I'm another yellow jacket. Um, and I took one robotics class when I was at Georgia Tech, but we didn't get to touch the robot. Only the grad students did. So we wrote the software and then we went and stood behind a shield and watched the grad student deploy it on the robot to see if it worked. And I was like, boo, this isn't fun. So I said, I'm gonna get my PhD and I'm gonna teach my own robotics class and I'm gonna let the students touch the robot. So a lot of what I'm gonna share with you today is the things I do with my undergraduates with respect to robotics. So I wanted to start out by um, reading this um, excerpt from Richard Boyer's book that states that the work of the professoriate is centered by four separate overlapping functions, the scholarship of discovery, integration, application, and teaching and that these must have a synthesis of research practice and teaching. And I, I call this the intersectionality of being a professor and being a black woman in STEM, a black woman in engineering, it is extremely important that I bring this intersectionality into everything that I do. So this quote at the bottom is one that I came up with with some colleagues when they tried to describe who I was because I'm not really a roboticist, I'm not really an electrical engineer, I'm not really a computer science, I'm all of that. I'm all of that in a bag of chips, right? So I say, I bring robotics and STEM to people, and I bring people to robotics and STEM as I use all these things together to diversify the profession. And then I had to get a Twitter handle, so now I have a, a Twitter identity as well, and I'm the Norse feminist. I made it up, and if you speak French, I know it's not right, but it works for me. So here are some images from some of my work by, where I bring together this intersectionality between service and teaching as well as research. So I have been a judge as well as a mentor for FIRST Robotics teams. Um, so over here is where I got a Volunteer of the Year Award for being FIRST Robotics mentor. Down here, I'm also a mentor for FIRST LEGO League team. It's the Game of Girls, and it's also a Girl Scouts team, so it's all girls. And of course, I gotta show you my baby down here in the corner. Um, this one in the middle is me doing outreach for other all girls events. I'm really big on the little girls because that's who we need to get into robotics and STEM. And here's one with some of my students. These are um, one of my senior students and then some of my freshmen. So I try to bring this intersectional nature to everything that I do. So I'm always thinking about if I'm doing something, is this something I can use for outreach? Can I use this to help diversify the profession as well? So what I've done with my colleagues at Rose Holman is we created the first ever multidisciplinary minor in robotics. What we found is that due to the success of FIRST Robotics and Bex and Botball and all these things, we had students coming to the school and saying, I want to study robotics. We had no robotics. We have electrical engineering. We have mechanical engineering. We have computer science. We have no robotics. But what we found was that all of us, or at least one faculty member in every department was doing something robotics related. Kinematics, mechatronics, robotics engineering. I was teaching mobile robotics. So we basically put all of our courses together and we now have multidisciplinary senior design and we created this robotics minor and it became so successful that we now have several multidisciplinary minors at the school. We have minors in data science, biomath, because we quickly learned that getting a STEM degree is not done in a silo. You very, very rarely are gonna go work somewhere where they're like, okay, go out and sit over there with all the mechanical engineers and do something. Sit over there with all the electrical engineers and do something. So you have to learn to work with these multiple disciplines. And it's great for teaching them how to talk to people across the, the cubicle about divergent interests, the, the different prerequisites. So after their sophomore year, they're in classes together. My mobile robotics class has electrical, mechanical, computer science, software engineering students, and they're on teams together. And they don't all have the same skill sets. You're talking about CS and SE students. They don't always know how to wire up a robot. They don't know how to breadboard, but they all have to be doing those things in order to finish the class. So, a big part of what I wanna share is, I wanna do a little show and tell because I just don't like talking to people. So I'm gonna be showing videos for the rest of my presentation until they cut me off. And the first one I, I wanted to start with are my freshmen. So my freshmen in electrical and computer engineering learn um, electronics by doing Arduino microcontroller um, projects. And then at the end, they have to build a robot and put the microcontroller on top of it along with sensors create behaviors and tell the operation to achieve a challenge. 
So these videos are very short, but I want to show you the first couple of videos from the freshman design test. And yes, that's me. We have to dress up for the competition, so sorry about that. So here's the first one. Welcome to the Monster Mash. So one of the things I wanted to share about this is I've had several people say to me, um, female students don't like competitions. They don't like competitions. They don't like team-based work because there's all the stigma behind how the women are going to be treated and they don't really like this thing. I don't have that problem in my freshman design classes. And I think part of why female students don't like these kind of experiences is how they're taught and how teams are managed. And I think having a woman in the class as as I'm not going to have them putting the female students, um, you know, taking notes or doing all the paperwork. I'm going to make sure that these labors are divided evenly so that that kind of bias doesn't happen. So I just think it's interesting that some people say don't do competitions and things like that because students don't do well with it. I think it's how they're taught and how those things are managed. So you have to make sure you're doing cooperative teaming where you're looking at the tenants and things like that. So here is another short one. And <laughs> So obviously everyone can tell that I like alliteration by the titles. Um, <laughs> and that year was Plants vs. Zombies. We don't always do monsters. Um, we, we've done bowling, we've done bunny rabbits. You know, I, I taught the class for 10 years. I finally gave it away, I'm on sabbatical. So I, I was running out of ideas. So near the end, it was all monsters because I couldn't think of anything else. So this Thank you so much, video. Carlotta. That has been a really nice insight into all the work that your team has okay, been doing. Thank you. I want to pass it on to uh, Angelique Taylor, uh, Dr. Angelique Taylor, sorry, uh, to give us your introduction. Tell us a little bit more about you. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm, I'm not a doctor yet. I'm almost there. One more year. We are claiming yeah. it. We're speaking it into existence. <laughs> yes. Okay, awesome. Okay. Uh, Thanks for the, for the introduction. Hello everyone, my name is Angelique Taylor and I work at the uh, UC San Diego Healthcare Robotics Lab under the supervision of Dr. Laurel Rick. Uh, our lab explores uh, human robot teaming in safety critical complex environments, including hospitals, homes, and work sites. My work specifically focuses on problems that robots encounter in human robot teaming, such as robot perception of groups of people, interaction among groups of people, and social navigation. So today I'll give a brief overview of the work that I've done throughout my PhD. The field of robotics is growing at a vast pace for robot developments in everyday environments, such as hospitals, schools, and malls. On average, 70% of these people in these environments are in groups. They walk in groups, they work in groups, and they interact in groups. Therefore, robots need a high level understanding of groups to enable them to fluently assist and interact, interact with them. However, most of prior research in the field of human-robot interaction has focused on dyadic interaction, which is interaction between one human and one robot. Also, they rely on overhead sensor systems, which cannot support sensing from mobile robotic platforms. In my PhD work, I designed perception methods that enable robots to work in any environment without having to place sensors everywhere. And my work enables them to seamlessly work in teams, which will lead to robots that can work in safety-critical real-world settings. One of the problems that I, that I address in my work is how robots can work alongside people from both a perceptual and decision-making perspective. The perceptual perspective explores how to enable robots to sense their team and track them over time. The decision-making perspective refers to concrete steps needed to effectively navigate and interact with teams. Today, robots are being deployed in the real world, which is dynamic and chaotic. Therefore, they need to act fast and perform accurately, especially in these safety critical settings. 
To address these gaps, I built a group detection system called the Robot Centric Group Estimation Model or RoboGen, which enables robots to detect their teammates from an egocentric or first person perspective. I leveraged the intuition that people within groups are spatially close to each other with a common motion goal. And I captured this intuition in the group detection system by computing several distance metrics and images to cluster people into groups. This figure shows a high level overview of the system where we provide it with a video stream and it generates a box around each group. This video shows a demonstration of how RoboGen performs. The green boxes show the ground truth or what are human annotators labeled as groups and the red boxes show RoboGen's group detections. I compared RoboGen to two state-of-the-art methods and showed that it outperformed them in terms of detection accuracy. This was a good first step to enable robots to detect their teammates. And in my subsequent work, I aim to improve upon RoboGen's performance. After exploring the problem of group detection, I found that temporal information is important to make group detection more accurate. Thus, I made, it made sense to build on this system and also, and also track how groups move over time. So I wanted to explore how robots can lever, leverage egocentric image features, which are well suited for mobile sensing platforms. I was also interested in leveraging uh, recent advances in deep learning to improve the system's performance. Therefore, I built RoboGen 2.0, which combines both group detection and tracking. Uh, this shows a high level overview of how the system works. The goal of the group tracker is to preserve the identity of groups of people over time. The group detection method uses three distance policies designed specifically for egocentric perception to cluster people into groups. And we model the, apparent, the appearance of pedestrians using a convolutional neural network, which generates features that represents the appearance of each pedestrian. And finally, we use a common filter to track the states of pedestrians and groups over time. Unlike prior methods that require multiple sensors and computational resources, my system enables robots to detect and track groups of people in real time from a mobile platform using a single RGBD sensor. In the next phase of my research, I was curious about how I can deploy the system in, in a real world environment and the various challenges we could address with my system. I began to explore using robots to support teams in acute care settings. Like other safety critical settings, acute care is characterized by being a complex, non-deterministic place where people have a high workload and are under uh, time sensitive constraints and they must make decisions under uncertainty. Here, a key problem are operational failures, which is when a person doesn't have the supplies, equipment, or information needed to complete their task. These failures can, can be fiscally devastating, costing tens of billions of dollars annually. Though far more troubling, the context is like healthcare, it can lead to great patient harm and death. Thus, before engaging in technical work, it was important to first characterize human team dynamics in this setting. So as to not introduce another source of possible operational failure and patient harm. So we started interviewing nurses who work in acute care and surgical care, and they are the key stakeholders in safe care delivery and prevention of patient harm. However, because of asymmetrical power dynamics, as a result of physician dominant hierarchies, nurses are often penalized when they point out mistakes made by those that have more power than them. This culture contributes to preventable patient harm and <clears throat> with a higher rate of adverse events, including death and infection rates, as well as significantly greater costs to health systems. Thus, we were quite curious about how we might design technology to, <clears throat> which could take these dynamics into account and assist in empowered nurses. We engaged a collaborative design process with six nurses across the United States who expressed how they would design RoboGen to support and empower them in teams. We developed several design guidelines uh, using our findings from the study, so I'll share a few that I found most interesting. First, most of our participants talked about nurses with little experience performing resuscitation codes and how they must rely on reference cards uh, with the which have the required steps they need to do they need to do to complete a resuscitation code, or they need to lean on their uh, team members to tell them what those steps are. Therefore, our participants envision a robot that could autonomously navigate to a patient's room with a, when, a when a resuscitation code starts and walk the team through the steps to revive the patient. Second, they wanted a robot to perform real-time error identification and verbally alert the team when it identifies errors. 
And finally, participants talk about how chaotic it can be for form and resuscitation. And oftentimes their teammates might block their access to a patient. To address this, participants envision a robot that could generate choreography for the team members. And using a shared display, show them where they should position themselves around the patient's bedside. Then it could verbally alert them when someone needs to change positions. This study sh has shed light on to investigating uh, teamwork uh, from a nurse's perspective and provides exciting design concept for future robotic technology in acute settings. Following this work, I was interested in taking the work away from inpatient wards to center specifically on the emergency department. Since the pandemic began, the emergency department represents the front line of treating COVID-19 patients, and thus workers are ever more overburdened than usual. My lab has been working with several San Diego-based emergency departments, and from our discussions with them, we found that they really wanted a robot that could deliver equipment to them, specifically when they need all hands on deck, if you will. The design, to design robots that can work in these environments, we need to understand the severity of the patient conditions in order to make intelligent navigation decisions. For example, if a robot observes a patient having a stroke, it should avoid navigating to this patient as it might interrupt patient care. To address this challenge, I developed a system called the Safety Critical DQ Network or SafeDQN, which is a social navigation system that enables robots to deliver supplies in the emergency department while taking patient acuity into account. We estimate the acuity of patients in video using two intuitions. Uh, the first one is that high acuity patients tend to require fast, precise treatment, which ultimately results in very dynamic motion by the emergency department workers. And second, high acuity patients tend to require treatment from more emergency department workers than low acuity patients. This system uses reinforcement learning to model the emergency department with locations of the robot, its goal, and the positions of low and high acuity patients. Then we train state DQN to avoid the areas of high acuity patients. We recently conducted the experiments and showed that state DQN achieves comparable performance to classic navigation algorithms. However, our system has an understanding of patient acuity while others do not, making it well suited for the, for the emergency department. In the future, we plan to validate safety QN on a mobile robot, which will work alongside clinical learners at our university's medical simulation and training center. My work addresses fundamental perception and decision-making problems that enable robots to effectively identify groups of people, track them over time and navigate and interact among them in safety critical environments. I would like to give a special thanks to my advisor and my sponsors of my PhD work. And thank you. Thank you so much, Angelique, for giving us a deep dive into some of your work. And we'll wrap up the introductions with Dr. Ariel Anders. Oh, hi. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. My, my uh, Zoom window uh, is automatically hiding, which is good, but I could not unmute. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to be here and share this really incredible panel. Uh, I am Ari, I go by mostly Ari, but sometimes Dr. Anders or my web handle on a safari. Um, and I wanna say I've been doing robotics for only a third of my life, although I'm looking forward to when that'll become the majority of my life. Um, and because of that, being a roboticist is not, I would say, a huge part of my original identity, although it is today. Um, but for the majority of my life, I was really dreaming about, you know, being a medical doctor. Um, and somewhere around, you know, high school through college, I transitioned from medical doctor to doctor of philosophy. And because of that, I think you know, such a big part of who I am and how I approach robotics is incredibly influenced by my family. Um, you know, I just want to give a shout out to my parents and my siblings for always supporting me and pushing me to dream and inspiring me. I also grew up riding horses. And I think anyone who's worked with animals in a barn setting knows that you become very responsible because, you know, there's so much you have to do to take care of an animal. And so I think a lot of the sort of responsibility and grit I got from uh, doing horseback riding. And so eventually I went to college at UC Santa Cruz where I kind of threw myself at a computer engineering uh, major. 
And I say through myself because I really did not know what computer engineering was or like what major to even choose. But I went into it with the mindset of, I wanna give this a try. And if it works out, it works out. And if it doesn't work out, well, I'll try something different. And well, it worked out. I actually really enjoyed my time. Uh, I, you know, for me, programming kind of was one of those natural things. And that's, you know, just something I've always felt very fortunate about. So, you know, at UC Santa Cruz, I feel like I self-actualized into a computer engineer. And before that, I really loved cooking and I liked sewing and I liked horseback riding. Um, and so now I, I, you know, when I went to MIT, I, I finally became what I think of myself as a roboticist. You know, and at MIT, there is a big hacking culture. So I met other people who were interested in just putting things together and making things work. I also was a member of the Learning and Intelligent Systems group for both my master's and doctorate work. And I think that was just a really wonderful environment. There's an image of the PR2 right up here, and that's the robot I uh, programmed for my uh, master's and PhD work. And I just want to pause and say we have the best career. So a roboticist, this is the Wikipedia definition, um, is one who conceptualizes, designs, builds, programs, and experiments with robots. And when I heard this definition, I was like, you know, that, that actually fits pretty well. Um, I think every roboticist brings, you know, their own flavor to, to their work. And for me, I think kind of that really diverse gooey background of all the things I, I identify with really showed up in my professional research. You know, I am really interested in AI. I was part of the CSAIL, which I don't think I um, explained the acronym, which is the Computer Science and AI Lab. So artificial intelligence is something I'm interested in. I'm really into planning and reasoning about uncertainty, but I also care a lot about making stuff work on a real physical system. Coming from my computer engineering background, I think I felt more comfortable with trying to get drivers and sensors and things like that to work on a robot. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, being flexible in what you work on is really a huge asset in robotics. You know, it's great to have depth in some areas, but also be aware of, of fields around you or have some experience in those areas. It helps you program robots and get them working. So I think it'll come as no surprise that robotics is interdisciplinary. And, you know, at some point, I, I can't even remember what proposal I was writing something for, but I, I Googled up, you know, robotics. And uh, since Plan Act showed up and like, this is the robotics paradigm. And, and I thought about it, I'm like, you know, yeah, I, I think I can't even remember how far along in my robotics career I was, but uh, by then I had actually programmed a robot. So, you know, then I'm learning about Sense Plan Act. I'm thinking, yeah, that's pretty reasonable. But, but you know, it's, it's actually really hard to, to glue these things together. Um, it, it really is, the, the glue's hard. And so I think for me, this glue is what really inspired me and what really pushed me and like really, in, you know, my, had a big impact on my research interests. Um, how do we connect these things? And again, this is like, even, this is a simple paradigm. This isn't necessarily the paradigm I chose to use, but when you think about a robot that somehow has sensors and actuators, how do you figure out how to get it to do stuff that is reasonable? Um, and, you know, also, this doesn't even talk about the context of which a robot is working. You know, what about the human interaction aspects of it? So for me, I spent a lot of time thinking about the, the glue. How do we have principled approaches that, you know, reason about the sort of sensing and the acting? And for me, I really wanted to use planning as sort of the vehicle for putting these things together. My PhD work was in the field of approximate conformant planning. And uh, I got to say, this picture on the left is some, this is probably the pinnacle of my Photoshop skills, but I'm really proud of it. So this robot is giving an example of executing a, a conformant plan and it's wearing a blindfold. And so the blindfold is just to indicate that it doesn't have external sensing right now. So it's not say, uh, using a camera to look at the objects. 
Um, and so kind of a little bit more context, I was thinking about manipulation strategies. So how could you get a robot to manipulate objects? Um, and one of the things I wanted it to do was not always have to use, you know, vision the whole time it's doing manipulation. So kind of just for you, think about it. Like how many times have you stuck your hand in a pocket and grabbed something? Uh, were you looking at the objects you grabbed the whole time? How can robots do that? Uh, that was kind of one of the questions I had was like, how can we get robots to manipulate objects without having to be specifically looking at them the entire time or have perfect state in, um, information? I think, you know, again, if we look at household helper robots, you know, a robot that shows up in your house and helps clean things, it won't have the setting of a lab where maybe there's no, you know, occlusions of other objects. It will have to just, you know, make make do with what it what it has. And so my work was kind of in this space. And I don't think it's a good idea to have blind robots running around in the home. But so really focusing on sort of small scale manipulation tasks for rearranging objects. And then kind of tying back into that sort of intersection of the different areas I was interested in. Um, my work really combined, it found a way to combine, you know, using planning using physical simulations, using ML, and uh, actually pushed myself to do experiments on a physical robot. And the whole goal was trying to get things to be as reliable as possible. Given the current tools that I had uh, access to, and I have a video of the robot working in action. So here is the PR2 robot, that is me. I give the robot a block, the robot would put the block down, and then it would push the block using a paddle and it's under other arm and to create sort of an L-shaped um, arrangement of blocks. And so one of the cool parts about this work is since the robot places the block, it doesn't have to look at the block. It kind of has a region that it thinks the block was placed in. So the 2D overlay shows kind of uh, a 2D projection of where we think the, the block can be. So I'll just replay the, the block, the video, so you can look at it. So unfortunately, I don't have time to really go into a lot of the depth of this research or how I even had the model of the transition of these uh, regions that we see projected onto the screen. Um, but it was really combining a ton of things. And I was thinking about that sort of glue. How do, how do we put things together? How do we make things work on a robot? And uh, this work was in the aim of trying to get things to be more reliable. Um, it worked in simulation. So I ran very rigorous simulation tests for a variety of different blocks and different types of arrangements. And all the simulated experiments were successful. Um, this is not actually very exciting because I was doing conformant planning, which means it should always work. And I trained from data collected in the simulator in the same environment. So that just says I kind of had the conformant setup correct. Um, you know, and we also know that there's kind of this gap from the simulation to reality transfer. And so in my physical robot experiments, I had 24 out of 25 that were successful. And I did the math that was 96%, uh, which at the time I was really excited because before this project, I had very flaky robotics uh, performance. So, you know, having a robot be able to arrange this number of blocks and have it work this, this reliably was actually something really exciting. Um, and it also kind of pushed myself to sort of the sort of limitation of what can I do? You know, one thing that I always um, know, knew about the work I was doing was that it was in block world. It was in two, 2D or 2.5D because we had the, the orientation, but it, it really was just like, we, I wanted to go bigger, I wanted to go further. 
Um, and this really kind of was what pushed me to look at industry uh, because robotics is such a team sport. In the video you saw, I was the videographer. Um, I was the person who, you know, even figured out how to do some sort of 2D projection pinhole camera. Um, I was the person who was, um, you know, created a physics simulator environment that kind of replicated the real world environment. I collected data, I did the ML, I did the planning. I did a lot of work. I was uh, often a robotic sys admin, creating user accounts or just figuring out networking issues. And I just felt like I need to join people to really push robotics where I want to see it going. Uh, so the next step in my career was joining Robust AI. And, and this, is, this was actually really weird because I have been very clear that I will not join a startup. I am incredibly risk adverse. So I do not want to join a startup. I still don't want to join a startup. Um, but I did join Robust and it's, it is kind of silly. Like, well, you just said you won't do this, but then you did, why'd you do that? And I think it was this sort of shared vision where we are interested in not just having this sort of short incremental progress, but building the world's first industrial grade cognitive engine. And I think there was also this emphasis on like, we need a team to do this. No one can do this alone. And that desire to look at reliable robots. So robots that actually work in the wild, not in constrained lab environments. And so I've been here since uh, last July and I've been able to see our team grow and continue to grow. And one thing that's been exciting about all the people who's joined um, is that we usually like, a lot of the engineers have such a broad background. Um, and so it's kind of like similar in that sense where we don't want people who just do one specific thing, but kind of that broad background, because I think we need to have more of that. We need people who have some experience and expertise. And that is really how we get to be more collaborative and make the, the work we do um, happen. So I want to kind of wrap things up with just saying our field needs everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be on this panel. I, this is a copy of um, the, I think I made a LinkedIn post saying, I'm excited to be on this panel. And the reason I'm so excited to be on this panel is because we have different, you know, we have people on the panel with different times of their careers. We have students, we have people in industry, we have faculty members. And I think that is so important. We need more of that. We need to stop just developing robots with a team of PhD people. We need to develop robots with everyone, everyone of different backgrounds. Um, there's a lot of examples of why, you know, in other versions of AI that having a small and similar team doesn't lead to a great inclusive product. At Robust AI, we've been talking about how robotics, you know, we, robotics can grow. We have the potential to transform this sort of $50 billion industry to a tr trillion dollar, dollar industry. And so given, I think everyone knows that robotics is going to grow. And because of that, we really need to have all voices participate so thank you. Thank the you. Summary so much, of my Arian. talk. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, good. You can wrap up. Yeah. So just the summary of my talk is that robotics is a team sport playing in an interdisciplinary field, and we need everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have about 10 minutes left for questions, and we're gonna make this as jam-packed as possible. I'm gonna ask all the speakers to get straight to the point with your answers. Not everyone's gonna be able to answer every question, but I just want to uh, to to dive in with a with a softball question. Uh, did all of you want to be in tech when you first started? I mean, maybe show of hands. Who wanted to do something else that wasn't tech? And 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 what was that? Maybe in, in one or two words. I wanted to be a math teacher, high school math teacher. Okay, okay, still STEM, very cool. Um, my second question is. Um, is like, what are the ways that we can support there being other women or other people of color in STEM? Are there organizations, people, programs, like shoot them out because I'm sure that there are people on this call who immediately want to either get involved as a woman in tech or as an ally, they want to share the word about some program that can help 
um, with the mission that we all share of increasing representation, inclusion, diversity, retention, promotion of, of women in STEM and robotics specifically. Ariel, uh, I see your hand. I want to answer this one. I, I think we make robotics seem really hard. And I think we should, you know, make make people aware of all the access to all the tools. You know, you you no longer have to build a robot just to program one. Um, so we really get to bootstrap quite a bit and just bringing robotics to being more accessible, improving our, our tools for programming robots so that anyone can program it. Cool. Angelique, you next. Throw your hand. Um, along the similar lines as Ariel, um, I, the first thing that kind of came to my mind was uh, kind of broadly with tech in general, you know, we just have this really big pipeline problem. Um, so for me, whenever I, I'm, uh, I ask, I'm asked questions like this, I mean, the first thing I want to do is, okay, let's go play with kids. Let's expose, people, expose this to kids. And I think Errol is exactly right. I mean, whenever I talk to people about tech, even in, in general tech, uh, you know, people from different backgrounds, you know, they just think it's so hard and they, they can't do it, right? So I think the fact that there are all these women on this panel, this is a good example of how, you know, you can do it. Um, you know, th there's definitely a potential to do it. Don't give up that kind of thing. Um, but, but yeah, I just wanted to, to say that. Thanks. Thank you. And lastly, I think I saw Ayanna uh, unmute as well. Yeah. Um, I just want to give a shout out to the Black in Robotics, which is a new organization um, that really is about uh, diversity and the, the uh, promotion, not only of Black excellence, but, but of allies as well. Um, so just wanted to promote that as well. Cool. Another another quick one. What's one skill that you use in your research or your day to day work that that people might not expect? And, and Carlotta, if you want, you feel free to start with this one. Well, being that I was an electrical engineer, the amount of coding that I do um, to make behaviors and controls and everything work on a robot. And I think it all goes back to that multidisciplinary skill set. It's going to be that one thing you don't think you're going to need, like writing that my students don't think they're going to need, like documentation and commenting code. Those little things that make all the difference. Cool. One more, one more person on the panel want to answer that one. What unexpected skill do you use in your job day to day that people might not want to think about? So I'm going to throw out VI. So for those of for old school heads, uh, which is basically <laughs> a combination of VI for coding, doing a Python script, terminal prompt. Uh, I like it grungy for some reason, because uh, that's how I learned. Thank you. And then uh, maybe Ariel and Angelique, you can answer this question. I'd love to know if there was one person or a specific community that you would attribute as being your number one supporter through your whole journey in robotics. Uh, I think my parents uh, have been really phenomenal. Uh, my mom sent a ton of care packages uh, and I think, you know, they just set really great examples for excellent work ethic. Uh, I remember my dad telling me, don't let anyone take your dreams away. Uh, for me, I've had uh, several people throughout my educational career just kind of advocating for me and supporting me uh, from the time I went to high school, the time I went to community college, to undergrad, to where I am now. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This is Oh, can you guys still hear me? Yes, you're great. Okay, sorry. Uh, but yeah, so I, I basically, you know, throughout my my whole academic career, people have just kind of been there for me. Um, and without that support, uh, I, I definitely would not be where I am today. Awesome. My last question, this is for anyone. Uh, I would love to know, you know, there are people in this call, like I said, who might want to get into robotics today. What is the number one thing that they should do or read or watch um, to get inspired or, or, or to get them engaged in the industry today? I say be a maker. Um, there's so many resources online, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, go to workshops. We're actually going to have one coming up. Check it out on Twitter to see when it is November 1st, um, but be a maker and tinkering. That's the main thing. I agree. <laughs> no, like seriously, uh, you can literally just go out there and, and look for I mean, there, there's so many different uh, blog posts out there for people who want to get started. Um, and you can definitely contact people who are already kind of doing this work. And I know I'm always open to chatting with folks who are new to robotics and who just want to tinker around. 
And I, I would say, just play with things and, and you'll learn. I know I said that was the last question, but I, I actually have one more because, you know, I've got the summary I want to wrap the last minute up with. But, you know, the one thing I've noticed in, in all of the work that you all have shared is there's this social impact theme. There's this desire to understand the world and make it a better place and, and specifically using robotics to do that. Um, what is it about you or your background or your perspective on the world that makes you combine um, that technology with that social impact? I've seen that across all of the work that you've shared tonight. So I do want to answer that. Um, so I think one of the things when, when you're in a room and sometimes you're the only one, you're very conscious of your role in society. And the fact is, is that with you being in the only one in a room, it also means that you are usually thinking about impact because whatever you design, you want it to work for you because no one else is thinking about you. Um, and so robotics is that, that tool that allows you to create solutions that work for yourself, but happen to also work for everyone else. Thank you so much, Ayana. That was beautifully put. I wanna wrap this up by just giving you guys some of the key takeaways and the notes that I took after listening to these phenomenal women. Uh, it's never too late and it's never too early to get started in STEM and tech and robotics engaged today. Um, figure out how you can use technology to impact the world, whether it be with students or children or bringing it to your organization or just doing it at home as a personal project. Just engage. Um, be ready to work in multidisciplinary or inter interdisciplinary teams because robotics is a team sport and we need everybody. And that means you, your brother, your sister, your aunt, your cousin, we're all in here. Um, don't be afraid to create what you see. We've seen women on this panel create um, technology algorithms, companies, products, whatever they saw that needed to exist in the world, they just did it. They didn't let anyone hold them back. And, and another theme I saw was creating opportunities for youth. You know, we're all very, very privileged to even be on this Zoom call today. And there is a generation right behind us who needs us wherever we are to be their inspiration, but also to create opportunities for them to engage. So consider programs for youth, whether it's investing in them, volunteering at them, or again, creating your own, uh, something for your local community. Uh, and lastly, there is so much work to be done. There is just so much work to be done. Um, so we need you. Don't do not let your ideas of not being good enough uh, stop you. Start your own companies. Join LinkedIn. Put your information out there. Put your resume out there. Speak it into the world. Follow all of us on Twitter, and we are here to be that part of your support community to help us solve these problems and and change the world. So thank you all so much for your time today.